Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today's story is that of Rachel Nickel, possibly the most frustrating case that I have ever come across. Yeah, let's go. This story, like I said, is very frustrating and there's a lot to it. So I'm going to I'm going to try and make it as organised in the way that I tell it as I can. So let's start with Rachel Nichol. She was born on the 23rd of November in 1968. She was a beautiful person. She was beautiful on the outside. I'll share a picture. She looks like one of those people where their sunshine just shines out of them and they, they just look really happy. Obviously, I didn't know her myself, but from all of the things that have been said about her, she was very happy, very loving, very caring, very generous. And I just think personally, when you look at her photograph, like she looks like that. She looks like a <sighs> sunbeam. She was brought up in the Essex village of Great Totham. That's a, such a great place name, isn't it? Just makes me think of Batman though, because it sounds a bit like Gotham. Who knows, I should go and see if there's any like peculiar goings on. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've just realised that the washing machine's on. Oh, I hope that's not really annoying. Shall I wait? It should be finished soon. It sounds like it's on the, the, the end, the spin. <sighs> Moving on. Rachel was naturally gifted in the arts. Dancing, acting, all that sort of stuff. Very, very good at it. Ballet. To the point where her school teachers, parents, she could have gone on and, and uh, pursued that as a career, some sort of performing arts thing, or especially gone on to drama school. That's the dog knocking on the door. That's what he does. One moment, please. The dog's making a den. Oh, don't mind us, we'll just wait. Someone's building, dog's making a den, washing machine's on. I apologise. I'm going to push through. I think you can hear me fine. What's next? Despite everybody thinking that she should pursue a career in the arts, she instead took an English and history degree and she had a job as a lifeguard at a local swimming pool in Richmond. It was at this lifeguard job in Richmond where she met Andre Hanscom and he is also a handsome poet. Andre is a semi-professional tennis player he is a motorbike courier. Don't really know what that is, but that's his job. And he seems a very happy soul as well, from what I, I read. And it was like love at first sight. Reading about the, the, the meeting and Rachel as a person, it seems very lovely. The whole thing seems really lovely, which makes what happens even more tragic. I don't, I don't know. Just, yeah, like... <sighs> you know, everything was really good. They meet. She says to her mum that this is just the man I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. I love him so much. And not long after they meet, they she falls pregnant unexpectedly. So it wasn't planned. And this, you, you know, these things happen. It's, it's difficult at that moment where they adjust to this news because they're a new couple and you know they probably would have waited longer to have a baby together but this has happened they're having a baby and then once that sinks in they're then really happy really happy and they have a baby boy called Alex and they seem like just such a lovely beautiful family she puts her degree on hold she focuses on being a mum and from what I read, she absolutely loves being a mum and she dotes on her son and they have a very beautiful, loving, close relationship. The three of them move into a flat together in London and they also rescue a dog called Molly and it's just lovely. And she calls them all her little pack. You know, it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking though. Not gonna lie, I did shed some tears when I researched this story. As a mum myself, there are some moments in this and what happens that just, I don't, I don't even, mm, just got me right in the feels. And 
yeah anything that I think is like again like last week oh, I mean what's wrong with me am I picking really horrific cases at the moment I don't know anyway I will give you a disclaimer before I say anything if there's anything that I think is aw too awful that you might not want to hear let's now go to the 15th of July 1992 Alex their son is now two, nearly three years old. Their little routine is that when Andre gets up and he goes to work, Rachel and Alex get ready and they head out and take the dog on a nice long walk. So all different sorts of places. And on the 15th of July, they decide to head to Wimbledon Common. Wimbledon Common, I'll share a picture, is huge. It's massive and it's just lots of open spaces, connected with pathways and woodlands and there's a lot to it there's a lot of uh it's not just like a, a big green and because it is so large I can't remember the acreage like huge I'll try and share that if I when I when I finish filming but yeah it's very very big and and it's easily right like, there's often thousands of people there thousands but on this morning weekday morning not so much and they found that there were around 500 people there that morning so sounds a lot but not really when you consider how huge it is and how busy it normally is so it was a quiet morning what happens next is just sad so they've got the dog Alex he's at nearly three and Rachel and they do walk into a more secluded area of Wimbledon Common more of a woodland area if you like and it is here that and, th and this is honestly fascinating because Alex was two, nearly three, but he can remember the incident, which is, is sad, but they did gather evidence from his memories. And he noticed, or they noticed, that they were followed into this woodland area or this man appeared. And this man then attacked Rachel. He got Alex and he threw Alex down onto the ground and he then proceeded to stab Rachel over 40 times. A really horrible, sustained, violent attack. Alex can remember seeing the attacker go to a stream and wash his hands in the stream, wash the blood off of his hands. Oh, sorry. Because <laughs> this bit, I, don't, I, I did not think I would not be able to talk, say it. It's, I don't know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Maybe if I just be quick. The attacker went away. Thank God that Alex was okay. Thank God. But he just witnessed this awful thing. He said that his face had been pushed into the mud and stuff like that. But then he can remember seeing his mum and thinking that she was asleep and he was shouting at her to wake up and she didn't. He did say that she looked really peaceful and it really did look like she was asleep. And I'm so glad that they're the memories that he does have. He has that mem memory of her peaceful face because the injuries that she sustained were horrific. He then, when his mum wouldn't wake up, and he, he says that even then as a very young child, he knew that she had died. He ran up the path where the way that they'd come, absolutely frantic, to find help. He was himself covered in mud. He'd been pushed into the mud and blood, his mother's blood. There's not many that really get me. I think it... Uh, <laughs> oh... And it is really awful and really sad, actually. So I'm not mental for being so upset. Gin will help. And the news about this spread quick. It spread quickly, as you can imagine. Media started gathering at Wimbledon Common. They started gathering at the hospital where the baby had been taken, Alex, vultures. And so sadly, Andre, we forget Andre, he was at work. He was contacted to say what had happened moving on to the investigation which has started and is straight away surrounded by a media frenzy the police had to act very quickly they surrounded the common which is no mean feat when you think how huge it is they surrounded it and they took names addresses information of everybody that was in the park that morning they took witness statements. They wanted to know, has anyone seen anything? Like literally, they hit the ground running. They needed this information quickly. Rachel's body was taken from the crime scene and taken for autopsy. She had 49 stab wounds, one of which was to her neck, across her neck, and had almost decapitated her. And that's why I said, 
I was glad Alex had the memory of his mother's face being peaceful. They found a piece of paper on Rachel's forehead and nobody knew what it was or whatever. Turns out it was a receipt that had fallen out of her pocket or her handbag at the time of the attack. And Alex had placed it on her head, like as if it was a plaster to like help his mum. At this time, forensics was not advanced. They did their very best and they collected as much evidence itchy forehead as possible. There was minute specks of DNA that they found but they couldn't test it at the time because forensics like that was in its infancy so they held on to that. Good job. And they found a shoe print at the crime scene so they took impressions of the shoe print. They found flecks of or specks of red paint in Alex's hair and that was it. There was not much evidence at all. Alex was the only witness, it turned out. Once they'd gathered all of the information from all of the people that had been at the park that day, nobody had seen anything. So whoever this guy is, is dangerous as hell. Whoever had done this had also sexually assaulted Rachel Nicole. So this was just such a violent, frenzied attack. Really scary, really scary. I have vague memories of this being in the papers and things when I was younger. Really vague, like when I came across it, I was like, oh, I do remember this. The police were desperate for evidence, for witnesses, for anything with, to do with this case. They wanted to solve it. They had Andre do a televised appeal, heartbreaking. And the only witness at this point was well, ever, was Alex, two, two, nearly three years old, which is just very, very young. They spent a lot of time with Alex. There was two detectives and they would try lots of different ways to gather information. Sometimes they would use dolls and they would be different. So sometimes there'd be a doll with grey hair or a white doll with blonde hair, a white doll with brown hair or a black doll, things like this. They wanted to see what what would come you know was it like this or this Alex said it was a white man and he could describe his clothing that he was in smart clothes and that he had his belt over the top of his trousers odd and the black bag so they gathered information like this they they got some information the press hounded Andre and Alex it's just you know when you just like oh like you hate the world like I just so awful anytime they went anywhere Andre would have to put blankets like try and cover Alex's head they just wouldn't they were incessant they wanted a photograph of that boy and they would do anything like they they would wait outside of places that they were they'd wait outside their house in the end they had to move in with his grandparents and it's here that the police then put recording devices into the property in the home to see if phew, Alex ever said anything not to catch him out at all but to gather information like maybe he would say he's very young maybe he would say something or remember something and they wanted if that happened to know so phew, that poor family they had recording devices everywhere they had press hounding them press outside their house just awful Alex became known as the boy who saw his mum stabbed to death lovely. Enter Paul Britton. Paul Britton is a criminal profiler, one of those people. I think that's really interesting. So they look at a crime and then they work out, give their opinion on what sort of person would have committed that crime. Very CSI. Okay, now he thought it was somebody between 20 and 30, male, local to the area, somebody that has no girlfriend and somebody that would have been like sexually domineering with previous girlfriends, a history of minor sexual offences in the past, and someone that like watches pornography. Enter Jane. Jane comes forward. She was at the park and she says, look, there was a guy being weird at the common that morning. He was acting suspiciously. It was like he didn't want her to see his face. So whenever she sort of like, you know, was having a look at him, a gander, he would sort of like, hmm, hmm, like look away. He didn't want to be seen. Oh, sorry, I think I spat. 
he didn't want to be seen. That is suspicious, isn't it? Like, that's a bit freaky. She said he was acting like he didn't know where to go, like, uh, like he didn't know where, where, which way to walk, back and forth, whatever. And at one point, it felt like he was following another woman. Well, okay, that is really suspicious. Okay, so who's this guy? Jane. She then saw him later on, same guy, same dude, but doing it again, like following a different woman. So you're thinking, well, this has got to be the guy. And from her description, they drew up a sketch, which I think is a bit batshit because she continuously said that he, he kept on trying not to show her, her fa his face. So her description, I think personally, was a little like that's flaky, flaky. She said herself she didn't get a very good look. Not long after this, the description from Paul Britton, the criminal profiler, and the sketch from Jane, they were both released to the public. There you go. Who's this? Anyone know? Any ideas? And lots of people called in with a name. This is where it starts to get, whoa. The frustration levels are going to go, 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 go. Anyhow. Lots of people called him with a name, and that name was Colin Stagg. He lived less than a mile away from the common, tick, you know, one of Paul Britton's like criteria for this killer. He was a loner, tick. He lived with his dog. Paul said nothing about that, but okay. Everything about this guy as we move forward is just like, oh. Okay, so Colin they, the police, go to visit his flat. They go to have a look around and search it because his name has come up a few times. And they're desperate to catch the killer. When they go to his flat, there's like the walls, some of the walls are like chalkboard. And on those walls are satanic drawings. Odd, satanic drawings on the walls. He told the police, they're like, what's all this, Colin? And he said, oh, my brother did that. Like, he, he lived here before me. And he drew all these satanic drawings, not me. My brother. Rub them off. Okay, but anyway, no. They also found books on the occult and a knife. And it's all getting very suspicious now, isn't it? It's like, oh, Colin. Colin was arrested. Colin was incredibly shocked at this. Incredibly shocked and from this moment onwards maintained his innocence that he was not this killer and you know what the hell and let's just say right now okay so that you're with me when when we go through the rest of this story Colin was not the killer this is terrifying because Colin was innocent Colin was maybe a little, I don't know, you know, it's a bit of a shame for him. But, you know, there was there's lots of things that Colin does or... Poor Colin, okay? But Colin is an innocent man. The police at this point, two months after Rachel's attack and murder, they are desperate to find the killer to f bring this killer to justice. They inc so incredibly desperate that lots of mistakes are made. And this is what I'm talking about, frustration. Despite no evidence, no evidence at all on Colin, they have to let him go. There's no physical evidence that he's committed this crime. They decide to set up a, an operation to, to catch Colin, basically, to find evidence and prove that he's the killer, which he's not. But that, you know, they set up this operation, which by the way, cost like three million pounds. Mm -hmm. Someone's crying somewhere. Turns out, poor old Colin, that he was on Wimbledon Common that morning on the 15th when Rachel was murdered. He was there. He got up, he took his dog for a walk as, as per usual and annoyingly for him and we frustratingly because it makes him look guilty as sin, he took his dog for a walk on the Common but then he got a headache so he left. He left the Common bad head, go home. Rested at home and then went back to the common. And that just looks mm -mm -mm -mm. like, why, what? It looks weird, doesn't it? Like you went twice, what? You had a headache? Yeah, whatever. If you think that guy is guilty, that looks odd, doesn't it? But it was true. Basically, 
he went to the common before Rachel was murdered, then left, she was murdered, and then he went back. So when he went back to the common, obviously police everywhere, and he said, like, what's happened? And they told him what had happened. And he even said to the police officer, I was here this morning. I didn't see anything. Bloody yeah. Gave the police officer his details, said that he hadn't seen anything. He'd been there earlier. What have you. Very open, very honest, because he's innocent. And then left. No more dog walking today. Colin, being a, like their main suspect, was then brought in for like an identity parade. Is that what you call it? Not a clue. You know, line up. I think that's right. A line up. So he's in this line up. And then this woman that couldn't ever see the man's face, this shady man that kept trying to hide his face, she picked him out of the lineup. So, I mean, you can see both sides of this, like, bad luck, Colin, but also, you know, people want to see what they want to see when they want to catch somebody. So he was then identified by this woman as the man that she saw at the park, Wimbledon Common, being a weirdo. The police then thought, ooh, 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 let's look at previous situations or crimes that have taken place at Wimbledon Common. Let's have a go. Let's have a look. Let's see if anything similar but to this has happened before at the park. And they found something. A man was reported naked on the common with an erection. And who do you think that man was? Like, you honestly couldn't make it up. Bloody Colin. When asked about this, they were like, was that you? You know, was it you on the on the common showing your dick to girls? Like, what, you know, what was it? And he was like, yeah, <sighs> Colin. So, his story that he was just naked sunbathing and that there's quiet spots in Wimbledon Common where you can naked sunbathe. And that's what, had happened but his lawyer I don't know why I don't know why but his lawyer told him to plead guilty because they then charged him with like indecent exposure and they just wanted to catch him I think so anything you know like and this makes him look even worse doesn't it flashing your bits to people in the park or naked somebody thing whatever the case we don't know so he, he pleaded guilty to that and he got like a £200 fine and not much more because there was like, okay, the, he did that, he's pleaded guilty to it. Still no evidence that he did anything to Rachel Nicole. And that's what they're trying to, to prove. Really sadly for Colin, and it just like, it angers me beyond belief. The police were so sure it was Colin, they stopped looking at anything else. He was their guy. He was their man. Cut and edit. My camera stopped recording because I had filled my memory card. And then when I tried to take everything off, I've not done it before, didn't know how to do it. So I'm back on a different day, different attire to finish this story. There was a lot of swearing involved. I've looked back and I'm going to just start where I left off. Okay, let's go. The public were absolutely furious that Colin Stagg had been let go. They were also certain that he was Rachel Nicole's murderer. And effectively, he's been arrested a couple of times and let go. And that's like, mm, no. And again, the media frenzy carried on around Colin Stagg. Everyone thought he was guilty. To make matters worse, not long after this, they, the police, were contacted by somebody called Julie Pines. She entered a Lonely Hearts column, like back in the day you could put like a Lonely Hearts thing in the newspaper. She had done that and Colin had replied and they were having like a kind of pen pal relationship. This was two years previously to Rachel Nickel's murder. I'm saying Nickel, it might be Nickel, and I have been in trouble before for getting someone's name completely wrong. But don't come for me, I'm trying. I think it's, I'm gonna go with Nikel. Apologies if that's incorrect. Julie Pines has kept the letters that she shared with Colin Stagg for two years. I think that's a little odd, but anyway. And as their relationship was progressing via letter, Colin then 
sent a sexual letter to Julie and massively put her off. And in that letter, it speaks of having relations with her outside in the open air. So, mm, so this gets given to the police. Sometimes when you really want to see something, you can make it all add up, can't you? And it seems like this is the case and this is what's happening. And just really unluckily for Colin, like, mm, it's not looking good, is it? Showing his bits and bobs to people in the park, writing sexual love letters to a woman that happens to keep it for two years and then hands it into the police. Like, it's not going well for Colin. The police then have this letter and they hatch a plan. They decide to have an undercover female officer to reach out to Colin, if you, if you like. So in a similar fashion, this, this police officer, she's called Lizzie James, she reaches out to Colin and she says that she is a friend of Julie Pine's, sneaky sneaky. And she says that she read this letter, sexual letter, that he sent to her friend, Julie, years ago. And she has been thinking about it ever since and that she liked it. She wasn't like Julie, she liked it. And she was like interested to know more about Colin and she thought he was great. Basically trying to entrap Colin into divulging information. So, so begins this seven month long operation as part of Operation Esdell. I don't know if I mentioned that before. That's what the operation was called, to get Colin Stagg, basically. So she starts writing letters to Colin and they share lots of letters to and fro. I think it's something like over 40 letters. And as they progress, Lizzie James, the dirty minx, she starts to up it, like up the notch, like, you know, starts discussing things of a more sexual nature and really starts going hard trying to like entice Colin into saying things that he would like to do and it like it felt very pushy. Stag actually remained quite romantic and almost innocent and it's really sad because I don't think he knew his luck. He had this very attractive woman like had just come out of nowhere and just wanted to like you know was very keen on him so he was actually romantic and sweet and this Lizzie James just kept on pushing she shared very dark fantasies with Colin about being dominated defenseless humiliated in sexual acts and it does it Colin never ever really took the bait but as their letters carried on he eased up a bit and he did start to join in but it, it was entrapment he would join in he would send graphic letters back but at the end he would always apologize and almost be like like you know this is what you want but I'm really sorry if you're offended like I'm trying but I, mm, it's not really me you know like that sort of thing the police are not happy with this because they're like we need to get this guy and he is the guy he's the guy mm. so they decide to take it further and arrange for Lizzie and Colin to meet <sighs> always in public. I think before they met, they had shared some phone calls. And again, he didn't divulge any information. He wouldn't agree to, you know, he didn't come across the way they wanted him to, basically. So then they were like, well, let's meet up. Let's see what happens. Really dangerous, you know, playing with fire. If you really think he is this killer, you're putting your officer in, in a lot of danger, really. But they always met in public, in public places like parks, coffee shops, things like that. And there was always other officers close by and around, you know, for protection. Not that he knew. This is when she started to really get dark. She shared information that she was with an ex-boyfriend once and part of a kind of sexual cult. And that at one point, her and this cult had basically sacrificed a pregnant woman, like a human sacrifice. And Colin was, you know, this, mm, mm. he wasn't keen about this. He thought it was batshit, because it is. And, but he'd come this far and he really liked Lizzie at this point and he really wanted to sleep with her, you know. And I think he was 
ignoring the craziness a bit at this point like oh, okay and yeah he didn't run for the hills but that in the police's eyes was like a massive red flag uh you know she's just told you this blah, blah, blah. you should be like uh what bye but you're not why why but you know difficult isn't it again this guy is like a massive loner and he's got this very attractive woman that, that just can't get enough of him and really 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 seems to like him and it's not real which is horrible for Colin but yeah so it's not always black and white is it there's lots of grey areas this is the point where Colin starts to think that Lizzie is nutty he later told police that he did find the whole sacrifice stuff and lots of things that she was saying mad but he did, he was very honest. He was like, I wanted to have sex with her and I chose to ignore it. So, you know, he was honest. Lizzie started talking about the murder of Rachel Nacal and she brought it up a lot after this. Like once she'd mentioned it, she brought it up often. She said that she was gutted that Colin wasn't the person that had killed Rachel because she actually found it really like, you know, it turned her on. She's like, you know, oh, I wish it was you. Okay. She said that that level of violence excited her. She was so desperate for a confession from Colin that she actually said like, oh, if you said that it was you, I would sleep with you. Basically, you admit that you murdered this woman and yeah, you can have me. Obviously, that was not going to happen. She's a police officer. But that, I mean, mm, just doesn't feel like good police work, does it? And then, hallelujah, Colin lost interest. It's like, yeah, batshit, too far, too far, too far. She's gone too far. He lost interest because you would. New mug, by the way. Oh, and excuse me if my face is red as beetroot because in between these filmings, I had to go on a school trip with my eldest son and um, I caught the sun. <laughs> but I also bought a mug because it's my birthday on Sunday. So I treated myself. Oh. After seven months, Colin Stagg has not confessed to the murder and the evidence they have is flaky at best, but they do now have written evidence. Oh, I say evidence. They have information written by Colin in these letters and telephone conversations to say that Oh, like basically, you know, like sexual fantasies of his that really weren't even his because he was just trying to give Lizzie what she wanted. So a pile of poo, basically. They arrested Colin on this and there is some really awkward footage, if you care to watch it, I think it's on YouTube, of him being interviewed and them bringing Lizzie in you know, the undercover police officer. Oh, cringe, cringe, literally cringe. So yeah, I was like, oh, I can't even watch that, the poor man. Do you know what I mean? Like, and also like all of, it just your brain must flood with like all of those like uncomfortable things that you were saying to like sleep with this woman. Okay, like, yeah, I, I felt for him then. It's just like, oh, floor, open you up. However, he is effectively being arrested again for the murder of, this woman, Rachel, that he, he hasn't committed. So he probably had bigger worries than embarrassed, but you know what I mean. He refused to comment. Well done, Colin, because this is just absolute shod. They then, because he was arrested for murder, they then searched his property all over again. This time they concentrated on the garden. They were looking for the murder weapon. They, well, anything, anything to tie Colin to this case. You know, they really wanted him for it. It's kind of scary to think that that does happen. But yeah, they were not open-minded. There was nobody else in there. It was him to them. That, that was it. They didn't find anything. And Colin then spent 14 months in prison while he waited for his court date and stuff. Because obviously he pleaded not guilty because he didn't kill her. So yeah. Yeah. So there Colin was for 14 months. And while Colin was in prison for 14 months, Rachel Nickel's killer killed again. As you would expect, and thankfully, the judge in Colin's case just 
he was pissed off. He was like, what is this crap? What is this evidence? Like, you have just made him... I mean, what? Like, it was just... It, he was really cross. He was very disappointed. He said everything they had collected was insubmissible in court. And without that, I mean, they had nothing. They had nothing to tie him to Rachel Nicole's murder because he didn't do it. Very frustrating, as I said. Colin was formally acquitted in 1994. However, the police, the public, the press had none of it. They were so certain that Colin was guilty and he was Rachel's murderer. That was that. And he was hounded by the press and he was just labelled as her killer. Super sadly, Colin was not the only one that was hounded by the press. Andre and Alex were, and like I said, he used to cover his head when they'd go out in public and things like that. They were desperate for a photograph of this boy. And it was just, it got insane. It got a bit much. They would camp out outside their property and things like this. So Andre moved to France and they lived with his parents. And really, really frustratingly and annoyingly, the press found out where they were. So then they had to move again. So then they ended up in Spain. And it's just, like, that really is frustrating as well, isn't it? You know, they've just had this, their life has just been ripped apart. Just leave them alone. The police had spent three million pounds trying to convict Colin, setting up, you know, Operation Esdale, and they they just were like, we're not looking for anyone else. We're not looking anymore, because they were just so sure it was him. For years, the case just was like, me, me. They so strongly believed that Colin was the killer, and they just thought, oh, he's got away with murder. You know, we lost that one. So they just stopped. In 2002, a new task force was set up, and this was 10 years after Rachel's murder. So a new task force was issued to go through all of the evidence again. Forensic science, DNA, all of that had really progressed. So they were like, let's have a go. Let's see what we can find now. And they retested the DNA that they found on Rachel. There were two amounts two samples. One turned out to be Rachel's herself and the other was an unknown male and it was not Andre, it was not Alex and it was saying that it wasn't Colin but it was similar to Colin's DNA. So this is like, you know, the forensic science, it was good but it was still like probably really early days. So they, they weren't sure, they were like, oh it's saying it's not Colin, but it's really similar. So they didn't want to do anything at this point in case it was just, it could have been Colin's and, you know, the science wasn't evolved enough yet or it couldn't. And they just, so they were no better off really, to be fair. So they waited again and they waited again two more years to 2004. This time, the forensic science and DNA had progressed and it was a conclusive no, it was not Colin. 12 years after Rachel's murder, they finally have some actual evidence. They pop this DNA into the DNA database and would you know, a name came up. Also, let's just be real here, that's 12 years of Colin Stagg being the number one prime suspect and receiving hate and just uh, serving prison time, you know, let's just take a moment for that because that is awful. Okay, moment over. It feels like there's two parts to this story because now we're gonna move into the next part of the story. Colin Stagg was a huge part of the story because 12 years of this man's life, he was thought to be the killer but he's not. So now it's almost like we need to woo, switch gears and move on to the next, you know, what, what really did actually happen here. The name that came up in the database, oh, I've got pins and needles in my foot. Uh, ma, 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 ma. Sorry, it's like suspense. Ooh, what name was it? Okay, it was Robert Napper. Now, Robert Napper, he is something else. And okay, let's take a moment to breathe here because... It gets spicy. 
at the time in 2004 when they find that there is a match to the DNA and it's Robert Knapper. He is in Broadmoor Psychiatric Facility Hospital prison and he will be for the rest of his life because 38 year old Robert Knapper is a convicted killer and serial rapist. So pleasant. He's also now the main suspect in Rachel Nicole's murder. Let's find out a little bit about Robert, shall we? He was born in February of 1966 in Plumstead. I really like that word, name, place, Plumstead. Plumstead. He was not blessed with a nice childhood, as is often sadly the case. His father was an incredibly violent man and him and his siblings witnessed a lot of violence from his father towards his mother. So much so that at, when they were quite young, they were put into foster care. Robert was diagnosed with Asperger's and later on in his life, paranoid schizophrenia. He was a loner. He was bullied. He would make up big wild fantasies. Something I read like, you know, he had his fingers chopped off, blown off, shot off, bitten off, something like that. And then they just grew back. Okay, so a troubled soul. And then when he was 12 or 13, around that age, he was sexually assaulted on a like a family trip by a family friend. And it's just, some people just have it bad, don't they? And they get dealt such shitty cards. It's, it's you know, it's not fair. Friends and family would say that after the sexual assault, he was never the same again. He developed OCD. He was caught bullying his younger siblings, being just very unkind. At 16, he left school and started catering college. At 18, they must have gone back to their mother because at 18, he was then kicked out of home. His mother kicked him out. And I think that might have something to do with the fact that he was caught spying on his younger sister, like getting changed and things like that. So mm. he got a job in a plastics factory and got a bed sit for himself in Plumstead. And in 1986, best year, my birth year, he had his first criminal offence. He was caught with a loaded air gun and you're not allowed to do that. So he was arrested. In his early 20s, mm, he started like looking through windows, being a local peeping Tom, watching women get undressed, that sort of thing. And a spot of flashing. And in 1989, this is when he began a series of sexual attacks and rapes on women. These rapes and attacks got him the name of the Green Chain Rapist. That was because there was like a, like a walk or a, you know, a green sort of walk that connected lots of green open spaces all together. I'll share a picture. So uh, the attacks and the rapes were carried out there. He would like l sort of hide in wait. What does this sound familiar to? So he would spring upon a victim and attack and rape her. Over time, these attacks and rapes would become more violent. He always had a knife and he would always threaten with the knife. And nearer to the end of his spree, he actually did stab one woman in her breast. So mm. his first rape was August in 1989. And it's just awful. He... He broke in, he didn't break in, he walked in to a lady's house and he must have been watching her. So again, like, you know, his peeping Tom nature, he would be watching women and potential victims. He was obviously watching her, knew that she was alone, her children were home, but he, her back door was left unlocked. I mean, she was at home, it's not unusual really. And he just entered into the property, went upstairs. She was upstairs drying her hair in her bedroom. Her children were downstairs in the living room. It's just awful. He had a knife. She saw him in the mirror behind her. I mean, that's just something out of a horror film, isn't it? Can you imagine? That's so scary. And he attacked her. He, he threatened her with the knife and he said that if she didn't comply, he would go downstairs and kill her children. He then raped her and then left. And as he left, he made some horrible comment about you should keep your back door locked. Just nasty. 
This was his first rape. And a little while afterwards, a few weeks afterwards, I think, he actually told his mother. And his mother, she believed him. And she actually called the police and turned him in. She said, this is my son, Robert Napper. He has told me that he committed a rape and, like, you know, said the area. He hadn't given the actual address to his mum, but he'd said in that area. And this is just the beginning of a string of m even more frustration, so buckle in, because the police just, I mean, there's so many moments after this where it's almost like, what are you doing? You know, frustrating, very. They just were like, oh, okay, we're looking at it. And then they, they kind of did look into it. They went back like a couple of days. Oh, has there been any rapes? I'm not here. No, not me. Really. And that was it. Like, really annoying. Okay, thanks. Thanks for letting us know. They didn't interview him. They didn't take samples from him. They did they nothing. The victim, his first rape victim, when the police went to visit her, because she called the police afterwards, when they went to visit her, they did take um, a sample from her, like a rape kit, a DNA sample. So they did have that, which is frustrating because two weeks later, when Robert's mother called in, if they'd have got him in and taken his DNA, they would have matched it. So it is very frustrating. There were around 80 to 100 rapes along the green chain walk. 80 to 100. It's so annoying because he was like handed in by his mother at the very, very beginning after his first rape. So it's difficult to imagine that he then went on, you know, he kind of, he then went on to rape 80 to 100 women. It's like, oh God, like, come on. Every time, every attack, any woman that called it in, and there may have been women that didn't, but they would take DNA, they would take samples. So they, you know, they had information, they had evidence. And then from the women that had been attacked, they composited, is that a word? They compiled, they made a sketch of Robert. Didn't know it was Robert at the time, but they made a sketch. Two people rang the police and said, oh yeah, that's Robert Napper his mum has called up like you know months ago and handed him in and said uh he's confessed to rape and then two people have called you to say oh yeah that's rob do you know what i mean no, nothing and the reason for this is because and it's stupid hold on to your hats because it's just like i'm gonna burst a blood vessel basically a lot of the victims most of the victims said that their attacker was like five seven or five nine and Robert was six foot two. So it couldn't possibly be. I mean, if you've just been attacked, raped, horrific, scared to death, and then uh, as if, I mean, who's got a tape measure? Do you know what I mean? It, what? That is not reliable, is it? Oh, they all reckon he was like five foot nine. Five foot nine, six foot two. What the hell? Do you know what I mean? So no, it, oh... We're not going to bother with that because um, he's six foot, over six foot, like, no. Moving on, it kind of gets worse because at one point they're like, oh, we better get this Robert in. Oh, his name's come up a few times. Get him in. Take his DNA. So they contact Robert. Okay. And you're like, yes, great. We're moving forward here. But no. So they call him. Come in. We need to take your DNA, please. And thank you. No worries. Yep. Agree a day. He doesn't show. Fair enough. Fine. You know, he might have forgotten. Not every day that you're called in to give your DNA to the police station. Then they call him again. Rob, mate, you didn't turn up. You didn't show up to give us your DNA. We really need it. Like, are you still okay to do it? You know, because he's not like, you know, they have to ask him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sure, sure, sure. No thing. Second time. He doesn't show up a second time. At that point, would you not think a mm, little bit of a red flag going off? He says he'll come in and do it, but then he, he hasn't twice. Wouldn't you at the least persist with that? Mate, we really do need your DNA. And then the longer you would persist with that, the more red flags you would get. Wouldn't you? But no. Oh, he's not bothered coming in a couple of times. We'll just drop it. And they did, they did, and they just dropped it. There were quite 
a lot of similarities between the green chain rapist case cases and Rachel Nicole's murder and uh, the people working on the green chain rapist case did come and chat maybe it was an email phone call who knows a cup of coffee they talked to the Rachel Nicole team and said you know similar sort of area snuck up on attacked like this is quite similar could our green chain rapist have escalated to the next level perhaps are we looking at the same man and the Rachel Nicole team were like no we've got our man it's Colin don't get me started three months after Rachel's murder Robert Napper was arrested sorry there's a lot to this case I hope we keep, we're all keeping up maybe I should slow down Three months after Rachel Nicole's murder, Robert Napper was arrested for trying to print paper with a police heading, like in a print shop. But, you know, that's a bit naughty, isn't it? He was trying to print it so that he could, like, forge a letter that said he had permission to have a handgun. He was also arrested because he'd been identified as being a peeping Tom again. So they searched his bedsit. And let's try and remember some of the things here because they're going to tie in later. Mainly try and remember the red toolbox. So they find a red toolbox in his property and in it was some knives, a knife that was remarkably similar to the knife that had been used in the green chain rapist case, the poor lady that got stabbed in the boob, and an A to Z of the green chain walk with areas circled red flag they also found a handgun the police seemed to think not all that much about this a to z with circles all along this green chain walk not really like that was just sort of kind of discarded frustrating and in fact that was his trophy that was all of the little places where he had attacked and raped women okay he was given an eight-week custodial sentence and then released despite his psychiatrist telling the court that he was a danger to himself and to others. So, 1992-1993, Robert Napper has gotten away with lots of rapes, 80 to 100 rapes, and the murder of Rachel Nicole. He's been released and he just continues. So... Okay, we now have a part of the story which is very sad and I will give you a warning when I think you should not listen if you don't want to. Robert Napper carried on his spree and he would in fact begin stalking, spying, watching a woman called Samantha Bissett. She was 27. She had a four-year-old daughter called Jasmine and a boyfriend called Conrad. They lived in a flat in Plumstead and it is thought that he was watching her for a while and it was only a week before what happened happened that her boyfriend Conrad saw a man looking in through their window. So, and that was likely to be Robert so he'd been watching her and watching their movements. In November of 1993, Conrad went to stay for the night with his father and leaving Samantha and Jasmine at the flat alone. Very similar to his first rape, Robert entered into the flat and he attacked Samantha and sexually assaulted her. But then, awfully sadly, he then went on to stab Samantha. There were a lot of wounds to her neck and face and chest area just a lot of rage he then mutilated her body he he removed part of her stomach wall and they they didn't find that but that that was odd so he 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 did that which was that's a that was a new thing and i don't think in rachel nacal's murder he'd taken a physical trophy from her i don't think so so this was this was something new. So if you don't want to hear what happens next, you can skip and I'll put a timestamp below to when you can skip to, okay? I'm gonna start now. So after he had murdered Samantha and mutilated her body, he then went into Jasmine's bedroom where he also sexually assaulted Jasmine and then suffocated her to death. Just really, really sad. 
The following morning, Conrad came back to the flat to see them before he went to work. And it really sadly, Conrad was the person that found their bodies. They nearly missed some really crucial evidence here because the forensic team went in and they dusted and took fingerprints and any evidence that they could, as is usual in a murder inquiry. And they nearly missed his fingerprints. Oh my God. Because they were really similar. So Robert's fingerprints were incredibly similar to Samantha's. So when they dusted the place and took all the prints, at first they thought that they had no prints from anyone else. They just thought they were Samantha's and Conrad's and Jasmine's. They just thought it was the people that lived there. They were the only prints they thought that they had. And it was only a bit later when they sort of like re-looked or like double checked again, that someone noticed that they were actually like, uh, no, they're someone else's fingerprints, they're different. Jeez, like, thank God they looked again. Also, super frustratingly, and this is a good place to mention it, do you remember Paul Britton? He was the criminal, what's the word, profiler that they brought in for Rachel Nicole's murder. So, you know, they wanted to be like, who, what sort of a person would have committed this crime? He was also working on the Green Chain rapist case and then was brought in for Samantha Bissett case. Well, well, well. Never once did Paul Britton connect any of these three cases. Never once. And it was all the same person. So that is a career stopper, I reckon. When they ran the fingerprints through the database, now that they know that they're not Samantha's, thankfully, they come up with a name. Oh, who is it? Robert Napper. And after this, they then link him in other ways to the murders because they have a, a shoe print and they link that, they, they match that to his shoes. And they also then had eyewitnesses that said, oh yeah, he was there on the day, like, you know, around, around the flat. He was arrested in May 1994 for the murders of Samantha Bissett and Jasmine. And this is when it all starts coming together. And this is when they start linking him to the Green Chain Rapist and thinking, oh, could it be? Because they now have his DNA. They can match that to victims and bingo bango, yes. And they also have his A to Z because they've looked at him again because now he's been arrested for murder. And they're like, oh, look at this, this A to Z of the green thing and, you know, circles and stuff. Uh. In 1995, he confesses and pleads guilty to manslaughter for Samantha and Jasmine um, under the grounds of like diminished responsibility, I believe, because his defence said, he's not all there. And, you know, and I think that was proven to be the case. And that is why he was sentenced to Broadmoor Psychiatric Facility and he would stay there for the rest of his life. They did talk to Robert about Rachel's murder they did because at this point they were sort of like linking all of these things together. However, Rachel Nicole's team still believed so strongly that Colin was their guy that even when the Green Chain Rapist team and the Bissett team, Samantha Bissett's murder inquiry, they all kind of, they communicated because they were like, we think we've got the same guy, you know, the rapist and this murder. I think that was the fridge, but my heart left my body for a moment then. <sighs> Breathe. I think it's my neighbours. Okay. Oh my God, I've literally got a cold sweat. <sighs> <sighs> they realised that Robert Napper is, is the same person involved. They did talk to him, but he, at this point, Robert was like, no comment, no comment. Like he just, he, he wasn't talking. He was like, he said he had no involvement in Rachel Lacalle's murder. However, he was in Wimbledon that day. Uh, he was there and he was meant to be having therapy. It wouldn't be until 2004, like we mentioned, that the DNA would be a confirmed match to Robert and they would start to tie him to Rachel's murder. The A to Z map that they found in his toolbox had a circle around Wimbledon Common. 
the shoe print that they found at the scene of Rachel's murder. That was also matched to a pair of Robert's shoes. And the traces of red paint, like the red flecks of stuff that they found in Alex's hair, was a match to Robert Knapper's red toolbox. So yeah, they've got him. He was charged and again in 2008 he pleaded guilty for with diminished responsibility and he will, as he was, remain in Broadmoor for the rest of his life. This case just left a wake of destruction behind it, mainly due to massive police errors. The Met Police issued a formal apology to Colin Stagg. Colin was given £700,000 compensation. That is the least they could have done. I would have assumed more, to be honest, but it was a while ago. He spent 14 months, maybe more actually, in prison for a crime he did not commit, let alone all of those years of his life where he was completely ripped apart by the press and goodness knows what his life was like during that time. It must have been crap. So I'm glad he did get compensation for it. They issued a formal apology, like I said, but Colin was disappointed because they issued it, they televised it. It wasn't like to his face and he, he would have preferred that for it to be like a sorry to his actual face by the police department. So yeah, I can see, I can see where he's coming from. Lizzie, the undercover police officer, she sued the police department. This was controversial and some members of the public were a bit like, oh, what is your job? But she actually got like 125 grand because she was really affected apparently. She had like massive anxiety about it. She hated what they made her do and disagreed with it. And she said it like just had lasting effects. And so she sued, she got 125 grand. And on a slightly nicer note, Andre and Alex, like I said, they went to Spain. Alex is now a hypnotherapist qualified and he seems like a really lovely person. So does Andre. There was some footage that I saw and some pictures that I saw of them like now and with Alex as an adult and they look genuinely happy and really good friends and that's just really nice. That's nice at the end of this story that the sort of like teamy love, like connection that they had, the three of them, has carried on. And so that concludes today's story. Bit of an emotional roller coaster, that one, wasn't it? And also, there were some technical difficulties in filming this video, so it feels like I've been filming it for a hundred years. But I'm glad. I'm glad that I've done this story. I'm glad it's out there. Thank you for bearing with me. It may be a slightly longer video, perhaps because I had to film it in two parts. But yeah, it was an interesting case nonetheless. Don't you think it was frustrating as well? I think it was very frustrating. Those three sort of aspects that were all the, that same one person makes you realise that you, you don't want to get stuck on anything, any one idea in your mind because, you know, gets you in a pickle. I hope you can join me next week for another true crime story and a glass, mug, jar, bars of gin. Bye!